Hey everybody, I'm ready to start the webinar and the topic of this webinar is will colored light help heal um, your brain? So first, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Dr. Trinka. My first name is Terry and um, I'm a neurooptometrist. I've been a certified nutritionist for over 20 years. Um, I'm a syntonic optometrist, which is basically what this talk is all about. And I've been in practice for enough to realize that um, I can help people and that I don't know everything. Um, so that's a little intro about me. So the first thing that I thought I'd talk a little bit about is the history of colored light and healing. Um, there's a lot of different terms for colored light. And so I'm going to just kind of keep it really simple and easy. And I'll just use that term because everybody knows what colored light is. Um, as I, as I looked into this, um, it's been around forever. And uh, I mean, before, you know, before Christ, uh, 1500 BC, it was referenced in Indian literature. And of course, in Indian literature, they have a system of health that relates to energy centers in the body called chakras, and those are associated with colors. So that's as far back as it, that I could find that it had been referenced. Um, uh, there's a there was a guy who won a Nobel Peace Prize, um, and there's an autoimmune condition called lupus that makes um, different rashes on your body. And he figured out that if he could put colored light on the skin, it would help the skin heal um, due to these lesions from lupus. And he actually won a Nobel Peace Prize for it in 1903. A guy by the name of Niels Finson, as you see here. Um, in the late 1800s, people, TB was a big deal, um, tuberculosis. And so, people who had TB would go to these places to try to get better called sanatoriums. And part of their daily health ritual was to wheel these people out into the sun because the sun helped them recover from TB and some of the symptoms of TB. And so they called that heliotherapy. Helios meaning sun and therapy, obviously the, the sun's therapy. Um, so uh, been around a long time. Uh, there was a there was a just a brilliant guy, and this guy was named Dinshaw Gadiali, and he was born in India, as you can tell by his name, and he became a naturalized U.S. citizen. Crazy smart. Uh, he was an associate professor of mathematics at age eleven. And you're like what? <laughs> Uh, so he came up with this system called the spectrochrome system, and the spectrochrome system involved shining light on areas of the skin. It became so popular that he was actually invited, and this is kind of shocking to me, um, he was actually invited to participate in certain hospitals, and people got better. They, their, their symptoms reduced. He had a couple of doctors that were just enormous fans of his work. Um, and finally, um, in the late 1800s, uh, a famous author by the name of Edwin Babbitt wrote a, a treatise, a, a tome, a book called uh, Principles in Light and Color. And in it, he outlined um, some of the effects that light, colored light can have on health. So this is just some examples to say light's been a colored light and healing. Uh, that combination has been around for a long period of time. So what is light? Well, um, it's invisible. So can't see it. You can see its expression and it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which bathes everything on Earth. Um, and it's, it's divided, light is divided into different frequencies that are called colors. And so I have this nifty slide 
that kind of gives you an idea. And I'm sure most of you have seen something like this. The light is split up into the rainbow. And I, the big point that I'd like you to take away from this slide is, is that the smaller the wavelength, the more energy is contained in that wavelength. And so red has a pretty large wavelength. And because light is not only a particle, but it's a wavelength, it's a, it's a wave. So there's a waveform of light and a particle form of light. Um, and so as a result of this dual nature, we can measure wavelengths. And so it, it basically runs from about 380 to 750. And this is a incredibly small part of the energy that this earth is bathed in all the way from the very low end of radio waves into the high end of cosmic rays. I'll just point, I'll just point out to you that um, these wavelengths are ridiculously small. Um, and so a, a nanometer is a millionth of a meter. That's pretty small. And yet, um, in many cases, you know, it doesn't have to be a large thing to have an incredible effect on people. And this is definitely a case here. So I just wanted to show you where it kind of fits in to, um, uh, to the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's continue. So this is the key point of the whole lecture or the whole webinar. And that is, is that different frequencies of light have measurable effects on the human visual system and the brain. And what I mean by that is, is that depending on the color of light that you shine into the eye, because unlike Dinshaw Gadi Ali, where they were shining light and Babbitt and all those people, they were shining light on the skin, you have a unique opportunity to affect brain function because shining light into an eye, you know, the retina is nervous tissue, as is the brain. I think that the eyes are part of the brain. Um, and I make very little distinction between them because they're both nervous. Uh, they both have nervous energy about them. They have nerves. Um, they have um, nerve potentials. They have everything around um, uh, brain, you could say, can relate to nerve transmission in eyes. The only difference is eyes have photoreceptors. Um, and the brain doesn't generally have itself photoreceptors or auditory receptors. They feed into the brain. And so this is a key, this is the this is the point that I wanna that I wanna make to everyone. This is that you can choose different light frequencies to have an effect that's measurable on your visual system and on your brain. So if colored light has an effect on your nervous system, which part of the nervous system does colored light have the biggest effect on? And this is a part of your nervous system called the autonomic. So let me take a little time and talk to you about what the autonomic nervous system is. So we, instead of me saying the autonomic nervous system or writing it out every time I read it out in a in a blog or in a paper or an article, it's commonly referred to just as the ANS. And so autonomic nervous system, ANS, interchangeable. So here's a picture of the divisions of your, and it's kind of small, so I'll, I'll talk you through it. Um, there's a nervous system and the nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is further divided into the ANS, the autonomic, and the somatic. The somatic is what allows your muscles to move. If you threw me a ball and I caught it, um, then I would be using my somatic nervous system to make my muscles move to the position where I thought the ball was going to be. The autonomic has no such conscious um, attributes um, to it. 
it's all unconscious. It's all underneath the um, the workings. It's under the hood, so to speak. And the autonomic nervous system, and yet being under the hood, is unbelievably important in human health. And I know of almost no health malady that doesn't have an autonomic nervous system component. So blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, um, you name it. Uh, it, there's an autonomic nervous system component that's out of balance in each one of those maladies that I've just uh, mentioned. So the autonomic nervous system has a further division. And, and, and you know, to make this easy, it's just basically what runs your body without you having to think about it. So do you really want to think about your heart beating and your lungs breathing and your glands secreting? Really? I don't. I've got too many other things to do. Um, so this unbelievably powerful nervous system runs the show um, so that your so that your consciousness can take over and deal with daily life. Um, and yet imbalances in this nervous system are unbelievably common. And they're divided into two parts, a part that's that deals with activity and a part that deals with rest and they're they have names and so they're they're generally called the fight or flight or the rest and digest and here's another picture that gives you an idea um very common type of picture um it gives you an idea of what what these two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, what do they enervate? What do they, what do they go to? What pathways do they feed? And as you can see at the top, parasympathetic is your rest and digest, sort of your healing type of um, uh, division. And the sympathetic division is the fight or flight. And they get you ready for activity, for fighting, for flight and running, sports, you know, thinking, engaging, um, all of that stuff. So if you look at it, there's, you know, at the very top, we have pupil effects um, and salivary effects and heart rate effects and breathing effects and digestive system effects and um, the ability to handle glucose when you eat it. And um, in the autonomic nervous system division called fight or flight, this is what produces the, the neurotransmitters, adrenaline. Um, or norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, there's bladder effects, there's kidney effects, um, there's sex organs effects. And all of this stuff is under the control of this unconscious nervous system, which in a large majority of people is imbalanced. So What I want to tell you about the autonomic nervous system is, is that it relates to light in the following manner. When you have large wavelength and smaller energy in the red end of the spectrum, that's going to stimulate the activity system or the fight or flight. And the blue end of the spectrum will, of course, stimulate the opposite. And it's... It's really kind of easy in some people to tell right away whether or not there's an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. And the way I look at it is it's like a, it's like a teeter-totter. Um, and um, when one is up, um, the other one's down. And so you can't be resting and digesting and fleeing from a bear at the same time. Um, those two things don't work. Um, and so sometimes there's really easy clues to, to tell whether or not a person's autonomic nervous system is imbalanced, like they retire for the evening and their pulse is still high. That would be certainly, um, you know, an imbalance because you expect their pulse to lower and their breathing to get deeper and slower as they get ready to go to sleep or a chronically fast pulse in general. Um, often suggests that there's an imbalance between the rest and digest and the fight or flight system. 
pupil size. We're gonna get in. We're gonna get into pupil size in, in, in just a little bit. Um, but in because I'm a, a an optometrist that deals with light and color, um, you know the simple. This the very simplest statement I can make is red stimulates fight or flight and blue stimulates rest and digest. So it's really interesting to, or <laughs> at least it's interesting to me, um, what happens to light when it goes into a person's eye? And we all kind of assume that light comes in the front part of your eye and goes to what they call the visual cortex in the back of your head. Um, and so it, right there, it forms a picture so that you can have an idea of how to navigate your world. And indeed, that's true. But there are some other things that happen. Let's take a look at the pathways of light reception. This is from a brilliant dude, an, an, an eye doctor by the name of Jacob Lieberman. And let's see, is it going to show up here? Oops, oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, so if you take it from the left here where it says I and the sun, and if you go straight all, I mean, this is, Obviously, this is it's really small print, needlessly complex, but there's a couple of points that I want to make out of this that are super important. Um, so if you look at the eye on the very, you know, so the top left-hand side, and you just go straight across to the other side, that's the visual cortex. That's how you see objects, um, how you make decisions on where you're at in space, uh, where things are re in relationship to you. Um, and this is the classic pathway that goes through something in the middle called the LGM or the lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, so that's what everybody knows that light does. However, if you, if the very first time you can go upwards from that horizontal line, you'll see where it says retinal tactile pathway. And this is approximately 20%. And it goes to this place called, it's in the midbrain, and it's called the superior colliculus. This is a place where you figure out where you're at in space. This is a place where there's a visual map of you. Moving along, um, and, and of course, from there, you feed into other nerves that come out of your brain that make your body work and make your eyes work and make your eyes move. Um, if you go down, a if you go a little bit more to the right and then you go down where it says the hypothalamus, this is, this is the heart of the matter. This is one of the things that light does that's so important, and colored light does that's so important. And so if you, if you travel down here, um, you can see that there's all kinds of things going on down here. And if you get to the bottom, right before where that colored bar is, you can see that all of these hormones that come from the hypothalamus are potentially influenced by colored light. And so the hypothalamus, which is a tiny little part of the brain, um, it's the master control center. I call it the brain's brain. Um, and it, it's, it's amazing what it does. But look at all the hormones that come out of the pituitary, and the pituitary takes messages from the hypothalamus. So prolactin, and that um, has an influence on breast development. Um, you have thyroid um, hormones. You have adrenal hormones. You have sex hormones. Light and colored light can influence all of these things. To me... That's pretty amazing. So let's continue. So that 20%, as I said, goes to through this retinal tectal pathway over to the superior colliculus. And that's in the midbrain. And actually, only 18% goes there. And this, this helps you in how you orient um, in space. Where am I at in space? Where are things relative to me? All things that we take for granted, unless they don't work. Um, and, the, and then, oh boy, do you understand this? This is a problem. And this is very, very common in traumatic brain injuries. So this is why 
Um, I get involved with light, color, and what we call neuroglasses for people that have had traumatic brain injuries because it'll help them with um, with many things. One of which is um, the reduction of dizziness and the improvement of where a person knows where they're at in space. So if 18% goes to the superior colliculus and through the renal tectal pathway, then 2% goes to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is hooked up. And as I said, the hypothalamus is hooked up into just about everything. Um, and it, it, it organizes um, and sort of collates the body's internal and external environment so you can make sense of it. Um, in addition to a lot of I impact on, on hormones. Um, and it's what they call the final common pathway for the stress response. And the stress response involves a hormone that's enormously important in your body called cortisol. And we could likely have a whole webinar on cortisol and what it does, how you feel when it's low, how you feel when it's high, its relationship to blood sugar and the rest of your body. Um, but um, suffice to say, the hypothalamus does a lot. And if you look here, um, you know, it's it, right now we're, we're in COVID time. And so a lot of people are interested in how do I regulate my immune response? And it's not just supplements. Um, you know, we, there's a bunch of experiments that have been done that say that if you are happy, your immune response is better. Um, and the hypothalamus has projections into what they call the limbic system, which is all about emotions, you know, fear, rage, happiness, um, love, all of those things. The hypothalamus has a, a part to play in. Um, thirst, hunger, temperature, emotion, sleep, these are all domains of the hypothalamus. Um, and as I said before, the hypothalamus talks to the master hormonal gland called the pituitary, which is a part of your brain that directs the pancreas to secrete insulin, the ovaries to secrete estrogen and progesterone, testicular tissue and guise to produce testosterone. Um, uh, cortisol for adrenal hormone health, um, and on and on and on. So hypothalamus, a big deal. And 2% of light goes through the eye to the hypothalamus. So you can influence all of these things. Now, 2% may not sound like very much, but you have to realize that most of your visual apparatus is going to orientation, um, unconscious or conscious. Um, but there's massive projections. 2% is a lot when you think about all of the neurons that are going there. Um, you know, not, maybe not so much in, in terms of uh, percentage wise, but the point is, is that you can affect all of these things with colored light. To me, that seems amazing. It is amazing. Okay, so this is a little picture that just kind of shows you where the hypothalamus is. Um, and you know, the things that I've been talking about, um, it, it, maybe one of the things that I didn't talk about is, is that there's relationships between the hypothalamus and another gland in the brain called, or another part of the brain called, um, the pineal gland and the pineal gland produces a hormone, which is called melatonin, which is enormously important in, um, the regulation of your circ circadian rhythm, your body's own ability to tell what's dark and light. Um, and I've run into a, a fair amount of people who that is completely messed up in. And when everybody else is going to sleep, they start coming alive. And when everybody else is waking up, they start wanting to crash. And so their circadian rhythm is altered. And it's altered in a way that um, doesn't allow them to achieve their health potential. Um, so this is probably the only thing that I didn't talk about, and it's enormous. And of course, one of the applications of light therapy that you've heard about is, um, 
SAD, right? Seasonal affective disorder. And seasonal affective disorder is when the days get short and the lights um, are lower. You know, there's not as much sunlight. Um, people get sad. They, they become more depressed. And of course, full spectrum light um, works on this aspect of sending light. Now, this is not colored light, um, typically. Although in my office, if you had SAD, I would use colored light because I think it's very effective. Um, but, but you can, I mean, the point here is, is that you can send um, light signals to the hypothalamus to affect the pineal gland and the um, production of melatonin and get a, a feel for, a better feel for your circadian rhythm, your unconscious awareness of light and dark. So enough of the hypothalamus. <laughs> Let's talk about how do you figure out what light, how which colors to use? Because not everybody, I will tell you this, that if you look at American life and the amount of stress that's in our life, the junk food that's in our life, the amount of information overload that's in our life, um, it all tends to push people on that teeter-totter towards sympathetic, towards fight or flight. And so do I see a fair amount of people that I believe are in fight or flight? Oh yeah. But the same thing can happen. The same thing can happen. People can be um, overly rest and digest. Um, it does happen and I've seen it. Um, so you can't just assume that um, America is fight or flight and everybody needs uh, the opposite stimulation because um, it's not just that e it's just not that easy. Um, so how do we figure out which colors to take a look at? And again, I'm more interested in shining light into an eye or wearing glasses that are tinted. And that's, a, that's another way to do light therapy. It's quite a bit slower but it's effective. Um, and so the four ways that I know to try to come up with a light prescription um, is doing an eye exam and finding out some things about their eyes, looking at their pupil, doing a color field, and of course, probably one of the most important things is a, an accurate history, um, a careful history where you listen and you find out what, what's going on with that person, which is almost true with every health encounter. The history is really important and it's no different here. History is super important. So let's take a look at these things. So when I do an eye exam, um, my profession has trained the public to expect sharp, clear eyesight from a static lit chart while you're sitting still. And that's nice, I mean, that's good. Um, but if you look at the, the Snellen chart and you look at what time in history it was developed, it was in the mid uh, 1800s. And in the mid 1800s, we had um, covered wagons and we hunted. Um, and we didn't swipe screens, and we didn't have computers. And so there's a lot of relevancy of today's life that's not handled by looking at a static lit chart while you're sitting still. It does have benefit though. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm nearsighted. I need to have glasses to drive, especially at night. And so I appreciate the fact that I can put on a tool to see clearly. However, there is so much more. Um, and the, the things that I do in my eye exam are not only to make the chart clear, that's important, but to also take a look at some of these other things and say, well, what is your eye posture? Let me talk about that for a second. So if I covered up one eye, that eye would drift. It would drift in, it would drift out, it would stay straight ahead. That is what is called your eye posture. 
And of course, you don't see it when you look at a person unless they have a massive problem, an eye posture called strabismus, where the eye, when you're looking at them, an eye turns in or out. Um, in most cases, you don't see that. But if you never look at eye posture, you don't know some of the tendencies of the autonomic nervous system. Let me explain. When you are under the influence of an overly fight or flight system that's just jazzed up in your body, what happens to your eye posture? It goes out. So if you have a chronic outward posture, I'm already thinking, huh, I wonder if this person has an overly sympathetic system. Um, same thing for eyes that chronically turn in. If their posture is chronically in, then I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to be like, oh, I wonder if they're overly parasympathetic or overly rest or digestive. Um, and is there something I can do to help that? Um, a person has to overcome their eye posture to make one eye and the other eye work together to fuse an image so that you see one image. So eye posture is important, and it's a part of a good eye exam, especially from a functional optometrist like myself. Um, there's another term that I use for focusing. It's called accommodation. That is the... That's the term for you changing the shape of the lens in your eye so that it becomes more round. And as a result of it becoming more round, you see clearly up close. And so this is what starts to fail as you get into your mid 40s. Your ability to change the shape of your lens goes down. But I see focusing problems in eight year olds. And of course they don't have they don't have a problem with age, you know, they're eight, um, but yet they have a weak focusing system. Well, guess what? The fight or flight system, the sympathetic nervous system will shut down your focusing system. So you have an active, you're, you're 25 years old and the print on the, on the book or the computer starts to tend to look blurry. One of the things I'm asking is why? And of course, all functional healthcare practitioners ask this question. You kind of always tell what kind of office you're in. Is it a, 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 what, a what office or a why office? And in my office, as well as Dr. Stedman's office, it's a why office. We want to know what is the mechanism. So one of the mechanisms for a weak focusing system can be an overly sympathetic system. Um, and when a person has a large degree of light sensitivity, often it's because they can't control their pupils very well. And there's a defect or a problem in the autonomic nervous system. And so in the autonomic nervous system, guess which side tends to make your pupils big? You're right, the fight or flight. And if you, you know, the one way to think about this is, is that if you're on a, um, a nice walk in the mountains on a path, and all of a sudden you spot a mountain lion off to the side. This is what's going to generate the fight or flight system in your body. And so everything that makes you get ready to get out of there or try and scare the, the animal um, into leaving is going to be part of the fight or flight system. So your digestion system shuts down, your ability to read shuts down because you want to look far away, your eyes turn out, your pupils get big to light more, let more light in. All of this stuff is happening um, and it's for a survival um, reason. This is what allowed us to evolve and to become you know, who we are as a human race. Um, if we didn't have this, we would have died off a long time ago because we wouldn't have had the um, ability to mobilize quickly for fight or fight. Um, and so the problem in, in, in our society is, is that the mountain lion doesn't go away. It's always there. And so this causes a lot of, um, it's caused a lot of health problems. So eye posture, focusing, light sensitivity, all have heavy roots in imbalances in the autonomic nervous system. So what else can we look at? We can look at, and I alluded to this just a couple of minutes ago, is that um, you can have a chronically large pupil. I've seen this a bunch of times 
um, in people. And um, it looks like I didn't need to dilate their pupils to look inside their eye and uh, ascertain that their retinal health was great. Um, and me and you were like, well, thanks. Um, and they're happy because I didn't have to dilate their pupils. But in general, it's, it suggests that they're overly fight or flight. Your, your pupil should uh, maintain a normal position of about three or four millimeters, get a little bit bigger when the lights go down and get a little smaller when the lights are up. And so one of the things that we do in um, light therapy or syntonic optometry um, is to hold a light on the pupil and see what happens. And what I mean by that is, is that the ability of a person to hold a constriction is a measure of their balance in their autonomic nervous system. And so what is really common to see is when I shine, I saw three people today that had this. Um, and I, sh I, sh I shined a light, a pen light, into the pupil, and I watched the pupil constrict. It got smaller, and then I just held my light there, and I counted to myself one one thousand, two one thousand, and I just waited until the pupil started to redilate, even in the presence of a light that would constrict it. And so, what's normal is about eight, ten, twelve seconds, somewhere in there. I'm thinking, okay, pretty pretty good handle on on autonomic nervous system function, maybe there's nothing here. But in a great deal of cases, there's something called pupillary escape. And pupillary escape is an inability to hold that constriction. And so it's amazing when you see it, you're like, oh, wow, that's very interesting. Shine a light in, you see the pupil constrict, and then in about a second, it's like blown right back out, even in the presence of light. And you can do this at home, at you know yourself. Um, go into your bathroom mirror, get a pen light, look inside the, look at the mirror, and just watch what happens to your pupil. Um, it, does it hold a constriction for eight to ten seconds, or does it redilate right away? And then you know. Um, so I see this all the time. It, it's common, common um, experience for me. So, um, what's next on the docket? Um, functional color fields. I need to make a distinction here between a functional color field and what they call a static uh, color field. So a functional color field is kinetic. It means we're going to move something, you know, kinesis, uh, movement. Um, a static color field is more for the detection of disease, like glaucoma or uh, uh, what they call a scotoma, where a part of your visual field is missing, and we want to exactly know where that is. I have such an instrument, it's called a perimeter, and it essentially is a hemispheric bowl with a bunch of lights in it, and you cover up one eye with a patch, and you look at a fixation light, and you have this little clicker in your hand, and you click when you see lights as you look at the central fixation light, and it'll plot your, your, your vision. It'll plot where you see and where you don't see. And it can be highly diagnostic if you've had a stroke or a TBI or um, a toxic, what they call a toxic encephalopathy um, or glaucoma, very characteristic appearances. This is not that. This is something different. And what this is measuring is your ability to perceive color peripherally. So let me explain more. There's this um, pretty simple instrument called a campimeter. And a campimeter has two little eyepieces and a platform right underneath it and a graph paper that you look at. And you shut off one eye and you make a little mark in the center of the graph paper and you tell the person that you're measuring their fields to only look at the central little cross. And then you take a wand with a little dot of color on it and you ask the person, please study this color. I'm gonna bring it in from the side and when it looks identical 
to the color that you saw in the center, I want you to tell me. And so I'll take, I always do, all syntonic optometrists, when they do kinetic color fields or functional color fields, always do kind of a, a white motion field first, a blind spot, and then the three colors, green first, red second, and blue third. And so let's say I'm taking my little green wand. I've already done the motion and the blind spot. And so I'm taking the, the, the blue, um, excuse me, the green color dot. And I'm saying, please memorize this. I'm going to bring it in from the side. And you tell me when it looks identical to the way it looked in the center. And a person will say, no. And I'll do, I'll make a little mark. And then I'll do eight points in a circle to map their green color field. And then I'll do the same thing with red. And then I'll do the same thing with blue. Each one of these colors means something. For instance, green is associated with toxicity. And um, red is associated with circulation. And blue is associated with um, emotional and communication aspects. Um, and, and this is like, that is like the, I could spend a whole webinar on that. Um, just talking about color fields, how to do them, and what do they mean. Um, I'm just trying to give you all an introduction into the, the feel of what it means to try to come up with a, a light therapy prescription. So we have this assessment of motion sensitivity, that is the, the white field. We have the assessment of the peripheral color sensitivity, which is the... Um, the color field, and then we have uh, blind spot measurement. Um, in classic syntonic therapy, that's the word for, that's the formal term for light therapy, and eye doctors that do that are syntonic optometrists. And the, by the way, the word syntonics comes from a word syntony, S-Y-N-T-O-N-Y, and syntony means balance. And so that's what we're doing. We're trying to balance the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight teeter totter with the rest and the digest teeter totter. Um, and so we're trying to balance that with light therapy, with colored light. And so in classic syntonic therapy or in theory, um, once the blind spot is normal and once the color fields are as big as they're supposed to be, you're done. Um, and it can take it can take two or three months to get there. It can take one or two. Um, and very typically, um, we're going to come up with an RX for light based on these four um, attributes: um, the color field itself, the pupil findings, the exam findings, and the history. You know, if you if your history said I had a stroke last month, I would be thinking along a different line than if you said, I had a traumatic brain injury when I was 12 and now I'm 30. Um, I would be thinking about different colors because different colors um, can, they can relate to chronicity. You know, how long has it been since you've had a brain issue um, or an eye issue? Um, and um, that makes me think about different colors. Um, by the way, I thought I would read to you some of the, some of the things that I, I can help with, um, with color therapy or syntonic phototherapy. Much of it relates to eye function, and some of it is related to eye function. So the, the symptoms that are related to eye function are blurred or fluctuating vision, a lazy eye, which is an eye that doesn't see clearly, um, a crossed eye, eye strain or visual fatigue, light sensitivity, night vision problems, or reduced peripheral vision. Many times when a person is overly sympathetic or overly fight or flight, they have a tendency to tunnel down. And so they don't pay as much attention to the, their periphery. It can really influence a person's ability to navigate through life. 
So those are the some, some of the things that are directly related to eyesight and vision. And then there's some things that I can help with that are more peripherally related to eyesight and vision. And that would be migraines. Migraines are really pretty common. In fact, I gave a webinar uh, probably four or five months ago on migraines. And light therapy is a big, a big part of trying to help. And I've seen it. Um, I had this one um, psychotherapist that come in and uh, she reported to me that she has a migraine that's probably around a six to seven out of 10 every day. And my question was, how do you do your life? And she goes, I can only work about four hours a day. And so I came up with um, uh, a prescription for light therapy. And within about two weeks, her migraines went from about a seven out of 10 to a two. Um, and she was she was really thankful because she could do her life. She could she could do her, her job. Um, so migraines is a big deal. Um, you can help that with light therapy. Poor concentration or attention span also helped with light therapy. Reading problems, uh, acad reduced academic performance. If you have more of a tunnel vision, a lot of sports are based on peripheral eyesight, peripheral vision. Um, and so if you open up a person's periphery, they're generally going to be better athletics. They're better. They're going to be better with coordination and balance. They're going to be better with depth perception and just driving. Um, they're better at their job performance or sustained near point tasks. Because of COVID, um, we have tons of people looking at computers that didn't work, didn't used to look as this much as computers. Light therapy can help reduce symptoms for people who are getting what they call computer syndrome um, and tired eyes, fatigue, headaches, things like that. So I, I thought it would take a couple of seconds just to kind of tell you about some of the symptoms that could help because I think that's really important. The last thing I wanted to do was I wanted to show you uh, a field. This is of a person who had a traumatic brain injury. And you can see in the center that that's their whole color field. Now, obviously, it's not red, blue, and green. Um, and this is just a, an illustration of a person with an incredibly small um, field. This is, the, this is all of their colors are, this is all contained within the center circle. That um, off to the side, to the left, that's their blind spot. That's a fairly big blind spot, which indicates also some kind of trauma. So after this person did light therapy for, I believe it was a month, take a look what happened. Now their color field's this big and it's outside of the blind spot, which is the way it should be. So, um, and this person, um, much less pain, much better reading, um, an ability to concentrate that they didn't have before. This is all because of a traumatic brain injury. So that's the essence of my presentation tonight. Um, I just wanna draw a conclusion and that is, this is part of your toolbox. If your brain's not working the way you want it to work, or you have any of the symptoms that I went over today, um, it can definitely affect every part of your body if the autonomic nervous system is in balance. And I just think it's a it's a it's another it's another arrow in your quiver. It's another tool in your toolbox. Something that can potentially be extremely helpful to your road to healing whatever you have. And at the bottom is my, my classic statement. It's never too late to investigate. Um, you don't have to live with it. You can, you can get help. Um, and some of the help can be light therapy. Some can be brain-based therapies through integrative brain centers. Um, some can be through neuro glasses, through eye brain connection. It's all, these are all things that are possible for you. Um, these are the resources that I have used to uh, come up with this, uh, this webinar. Um, and if you want to get a hold of me, um, or the smart docs at Integrated Brain Center, um, here's a couple of phone numbers and websites for you to take a look at. And finally, this is my logo and this is my passion changing people's vision so that they can change their brain and they can fulfill the potential that they're here for. I want to know if anybody's got any questions. Let me see if I can make the side panel come out and 
does not look like it. Okay. Well, if you have any questions, um, you can get a hold of me at info at um, ibrainconnection.com or you can call either one of these phone numbers and schedule a free 30 minute consult. I appreciate your time today. Have a good day.